Well, uh, young people have been uh, in the news uh, <clears throat> lately for um, some good and bad reasons. Nicholas Cruz, 19 year old, 19 year old, 19 year old. What were you doing when you were 19? He was shooting up his school when he was 19. 17 people murdered in cold blood. 17 people. Florida high school. People he knew. And then of course, speaking of young people, the outcry for this senseless act led to a Oh, protest of sorts, it, it has all kinds of names, we're not going to get into the politics of it, but a protest of sorts by thousands and thousands of young people his age who went to Washington to protest, to say something, to express, I think, their fear. If you can't feel safe in your school, You may be wondering what mass murder and mass protest have to do with the title of this sermon, Dealing with Low Self-Esteem. Here's the connection. I believe that an important part of the solution to these acts of mass violence by young people is not mass protest or more laws to restrict the purchase of firearms, I believe the solution is the recognition and the treatment of low self-esteem in those people who suffer from it. Because the people who do these things, when they examine them, when they find out about their lives, when they begin to search for a reason, find out that they, they, most of them have one thing in common. And that's a type of self-hatred that expresses itself in this kind of violence. Now this response may not be newsworthy, it may not win votes in an election, but I'm convinced that it would help in reducing these terrible crimes one shooter at a time. So let's define the problem, shall we? Low self-esteem is basically the opposite of the sin of pride. It's, it's the other end, the other extreme. And so in order to better understand low self-esteem, be helpful to first examine pride and how this affects people. Two sides of the same coin here. The sin of pride occurs when we when we leave or we refuse to occupy our proper place in God's design. In Jude 6, the writer says, and angels who did not keep their own domain. Imagine, the angels, much more powerful beings than ourselves, have a domain, they have a place. They have a purpose that God has given to them. And the writer here in a rare insight that we have about angels, not that much written directly about angels, he says, who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode. Proper why? Proper because that's where God placed them. The writer says, he, God, has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. There is a great punishment for the being, whether it be an angel or anything else, that leaves the place that God has assigned to them. So according to this definition, pride is usually exhibited in a variety of ways. First, when we improperly estimate our own worth. Pride happens when we place too high a value on ourselves, too high a value on our work, our behavior, our talents, somehow in our own eyes much greater than what these things 
actually are. Another exhibition. It is exhibited when we measure our worth by the things we possess. The Bible calls this the boastful pride of life. 1 John 2.16. You know what this is, status seeking, exclusivity. These are forms of pride. Um, the marketer's best friend. <laughs> only you. There will only be five of these. Uh, be the first, be the only. That's all appealing to the same thing. Exclusivity. And self-sufficiency, another exhibition of pride. The belief that we and we alone control our own lives. <laughs> my body, my choice. Really? Your body? <laughs> Your body? You created this body? The effort at self-actualization and self-empowerment are forms of this self-sufficient pride. How many people work so hard to get to a point where they can feel they don't need anybody? It's like an accomplishment. I'm going to get to a point where I just don't need anybody. I don't need anybody or anything. I am self-sufficient. Now to a certain extent we encourage our children to this, right? Not to be too dependent, to stand on their own two feet. Uh, yeah, of course. But the person that actually thinks and strives to not need anyone has misunderstood what it means to be a human being. And so any discussion of low self-esteem begins with a look at the various forms of pride, such as exaggerated sense of self-worth or elevated status derived from things or the desire to be self-sufficient and especially without relevance to God. Never mind, I don't need people. I don't need God. Who needs God? God is for the weak. You've heard that all the time. God is for the weak, the weak-minded. The strong don't need God. Well, that's pride, bristling pride. Now, I mention pride because many times this is a primary problem caused actually by low self-esteem. It's not always the case, but sometimes pride in its various forms is the result of a person overcompensating for low self-worth. For example, a person unsure of self overcompensates by bragging and arrogance, by accumulating things that tell him or her that they're, they're okay. They're not just okay, they're better than everybody else. It's not the only manifestation of low self-esteem and it's not always caused by low self-esteem, but in a discussion about this problem, we would have to begin by saying that at times various forms of pride can be attributed to feelings of inadequacy and low self-worth. Now the temptation here is to drift into a discussion of this topic on purely psychological terms. What causes it? The various signs of low self-esteem, some cures and strategies to deal with these feelings, in a purely social and psychological way. That's what you hear in the discussions on TV and panels, so on and so forth. How do we deal with low self-esteem, low self-worth issues? I'll avoid that road because, well, first of all, I'm not a counselor, I'm not a licensed counselor, and also because we're looking at this problem from a spiritual perspective. Of course, this doesn't mean that our study will not be helpful in practical ways, after all, many such problems have their roots in the spirit, but maintain or manifest themselves rather in the psyche. And so for low self-esteem and its related problems manifested in such disorders as pride or depression or self-hatred or anxiety or insecurity, all these manifestations of poor self-esteem are addressed by the same scripture that spoke to the issue of pride. Romans chapter 12, 
verse three. Paul says, for through, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a, me a measure of faith. That's the key scripture that deals with this particular issue. Of course, when Paul, through the Spirit, says we ought not to think more highly of ourselves, he's also saying silently that we ought not also to think more lowly of ourselves. To think too highly of ourselves brings us problems, but to think too lowly of ourselves also brings problems. The goal, however, is sober or sound judgment of ourselves. To see ourselves as God sees us is to have neither a high or a low estimate of ourselves. And so the goal of both extreme, too high or too low esteem, is to actually begin having the vision of ourselves that God has of us. That's the sound, that's the proper vision to have of ourselves. Now the advantage that Christians have is that God has revealed to us our true selves and we can know this true self not from meditation or psychotherapy but from His word contained in the Bible. It's no mystery who we are. It's no mystery what our value is. We don't need 15 years of therapy to figure out who we are, what's good about us, God tells us. Now the conflict that people, all people struggle with is the battle waged between the inward man, and I use the man, you know, mankind here, so please bear with me. The battle waged between the inward man, that part of us still able to recognize that we are made in the image of God, it is what others call the noble self, or the higher self, or the creative self, or the moral self. The inward man aims high. The inward man seeks perfection. The inward man creates and promotes beauty and goodness and purity. That's the inward man. The inward man's looking for God. That's the inward man. And then there's the opposing side. The Bible calls, among other, terms, the flesh, our sinful yearnings and instincts, our evil desires, our shameful lusts, the things we desire, oh my. It's a good thing that our brain doesn't talk out loud. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes you know, I say to myself, did you just think what I think you just thought? <laughs> From here comes jealousy and hatred, adulteries, lies, blasphemies, all manner of sinfulness and disobedience, the flesh. And so much of our high, low esteem problems stem from an improper understanding of these two forces within us. Some deny the weakness of the flesh by projecting a dishonest image of goodness or achievement and thus create a self-righteous or proud character. I know that I'm corrupt. I know there's no good thing within me, but I'm not going to let anybody else know. So I'm going to project this projection here. I'm going to project this person here, this ideal person over here that everybody's going to deal with. On the other hand, there are other people discouraged by their weaknesses, which may have been emphasized by poor teaching or exploited by others in their youth, and they begin to believe that the flesh is all that there is. And this belief leads to despair self-defeating behavior of all kinds. You start believing that that is all that you are, the flesh. Of course, without the revelation of the gospel, 
The best that one can do through secular treatment is to recognize and accept that they are a mixture of both. That's the best. The healing process for the conflicted in the world is to mitigate the effects of the flesh. In other words, try to minimize the damage caused by your bad self. Therapy, medication, behavior modification, acceptance, catharsis, whatever. Margaritas at 11 a.m. Mitigate the effects of the flesh and accentuate the potential of the inner person. And you hear, you hear this worldly solution. Follow your heart. Just follow your heart. Become all that you can be. Be yourself, whatever that is, just be yourself. Follow your dream, live up to your potential. I mean, it just goes on and on. And we buy into this. We make movies about it. We have coffee mugs with the, you know. All of these are self-actualization slogans. I call it the Disney religion. Yeah, you, you especially who have just called out there, they're coming after you with the Disney religion. An old song summarizes well the approach to finding a balance between too low and too high an esteem of oneself and solving the problems that come with these from a worldly perspective. Remember this, oh, you got to be older than 60. No one here that age, I'm sure. But remember the old song? You've got to accentuate the, and eliminate the, and latch on to the, uh, and don't mess with, the oldest of you know the end of that song. Thank, thank you, Dr. Carey. So we, we move on. Now for Christians, the sober truth about self begins the same way as non-believers. The inward man knows God. The inward man sees his potential. The inward man yearns to do what is right and good what is best, the inward man, the inward man wants to be perfect. The inward man understands he can't be perfect, but he so wants to be perfect. The flesh, on the other hand, is full of self, full of sinful yearnings, enslaved to carry out the deeds of sinful disobedience. Paul talks about this conflict, uh, conflict in several instances. For example, in Galatians 5.17 he says, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. The conflict is that a Christian cannot fully give in to the flesh nor can he fully give in to the inward man, the spirit. Why? Because each of them have a pull. Romans 7.22, a concluding thought there, Romans, a long section where Paul is talking about this constant battle. He says, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, meaning I agree with the inner man and all the yearnings and all the things that the inner man wants. I agree with that. But he also says, but oh wretched man that I am, <laughs> who can save me from this body of sin? He recognizes that. But the flesh won't let him do that. And in Romans 7, Paul describes his own personal struggle with this conflict of him seeing, knowing, and wanting to act fully from his spirit, his inner man's side, but being thwarted by the weakness of his own flesh. Now there's some disagreement among scholars over this passage. Some people say, that Paul felt this way before he became a Christian. Others say he felt this way before and after he became a Christian. I happen to agree with that second idea. My reason for believing uh, is that he is speaking in the, is, is grammatical. In these passages where he's talking about this, this, uh, this experience, you know, the struggle, he talks about it in the present tense and he explains how he deals with it 
in his present life. So I'm assuming he's talking about what he's experiencing. I also believe that he's speaking in the present tense because as a Christian, I can relate to his conflicted experience. All Christians at one time or another actually feel the conflict in their natures. As Christians, we know the truth, we know God's goodness. We know the how and the why to live a Christian life before God. We understand and we actually feel the desire to do this. As human beings, however, we also see that even if we have been forgiven for sin, our sinful nature still has a powerful and negative impact on our overall lives, often diluting the impact of our Christianity. But for Christians, the result is not pretending that we are better than we really are, that's called hypocrisy, nor is it giving in to the feelings of defeat and despair or self-hatred, which brings about low self-esteem, no. No, for Christians, the answer is to have faith in God and believe in what He has done for us because of and despite our conflicted state. So if you know anything about the grieving process, you have learned that you can go from you know, anger to denial to bargaining and then depression and then back again to denial for another round and then maybe another round of anger again several times before you finally arrive at acceptance. And what is acceptance when you're talking about the grieving process from a purely psychological perspective? Well acceptance, true acceptance, is accepting the reality of the true situation that is facing you, whatever that is. Acceptance is not reality in the way you wish it would be. Acceptance is understanding and accepting the reality that is. That's acceptance. My wife died. That's a terrible thing. It's left a hole in my heart. It's changed my entire life. And when I get to the point that I accept this, <laughs> it doesn't make me happy. It makes me realize that I will always have a hole in my heart that I will always now be a man without the love of my life. That's acceptance. For those of you who are visiting, my wife is very much alive <laughs> and sitting there smiling. <laughs> when it comes to our conflicted natures, we often travel between too high or too low estimates of ourselves along with all the expressions of these exaggerated positions. But the Bible sheds light on our true selves, who and what we have become as Christians. As the one who wrestled with this in his writings, Paul serves well as an example of the true self in Christ. So therefore, a sober and true opinion of ourselves as we really are in God's eyes, which are the only eyes that count, a sober and true opinion of ourselves should be based on this fact or the following facts. Number one, we are in Christ. That's a fact. That's a truth. That's reality. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We are neither too high nor too low, nor should we strive for either, because as Christians we have a new position before God. We are in Christ. It's not a high or low thing, it's a new thing. While others strive to raise their esteem or keep their self-esteem from puffing up into pride, Christians can rest in the knowledge that their esteem finds its perfect balance in Christ. If I am in Christ, I am in perfect balance. In other words, my value as a person is based solely on my relationship to Jesus Christ and not on my abilities or my looks or success or intelligence or possessions, not even on my level of goodness. Before God, I am judged. Man's judgment is not really important. But before God, I am covered 
with sin and I am unworthy. That's true. However, what does Isaiah say? For all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. That's who I am before God, before I'm saved. So it doesn't matter high or low esteem of self, therapy, balance, whatever. When God judges us, no amount of esteem can overcome our moral deficiencies. We're done. You can be the richest guy in the world, you can be the most successful guy in the world, but before God, you're nothing. You're a lost sinner. When we come to Christ, however, we take on a new value before God. We take on the value of Christ Himself to God because we are united to Him by faith, expressed in repentance and baptism. Oh, because we are still human, there is the conflict that Paul speaks of in Romans 7, but because we are in Christ, that conflict has no bearing in how God judges us. I went to church two times today. I'm going home. I got a supper waiting. It's going to be good. I'm feeling good. I love you, Lord. The lo everybody loves me. I got the day off tomorrow. I'm going to mow the lawn. You know, I'm feeling great. I'm ready to go. Come and get me now, Lord. And then Tuesday comes <laughs> and a guy goes through a red light and hits your car. You get out cursing and swearing and mad and upset. And what happened to the Monday, hi, I'm such a wonderful guy thing. Now on Tuesday, you're ready to kill the guy that's totaled your car. Does that mean that on Tuesday, you know, you're, you, God sees you differently than he saw you on Monday because you're like a little higher on the good the good thermometer, I'm up on the good thermometer, I'm a little lower on the good thermometer. I mean, you get spiritual whiplash if you, if you live like that. What kind of legalistic mumbo jumbo you know, have we grown up with if that's our attitude to Christianity? I'll say it again. God's estimate of our value, our self-worth, is based on our relationship with Christ, not our performance. And those who are in Christ are fully acceptable and completely validated before God. And someone will say every time, you say, well, what about, the, you know, must you, act? you can't go around sinning and you got to do your best. Well, sure. Why am I doing my best? Why am I trying? Love, that's why. I love God, I love Him. If I zip my lip after being insulted and turn the cheek, I'm not doing that to win points. I'm doing that to say, I love you God, I love you God. Because you love me no matter how high or low I am on that Scale, I love you, God. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, there is conflict and pain as the battle within continues, as the spirit and the flesh conflict within the same body, but there is no condemnation because the individual is united to Jesus by faith, or as the Bible says, that person is in Christ. So we have conflict, just like the people in the world, but we have no condemnation. And this knowledge, this reality gives us the peace that surpasses understanding. It doesn't make any sense in a worldly way, because in the world, what do people do? They count. They count how much money do you have, how good you are, how many good works did you do, what, kind of, what year is your car? And how? They count in the world and they praise or condemn based on the total. God's not counting. He isn't counting. He accepts you in Christ. It's done, we're saved. We can't get any more saved. 
In other words, we have peace despite the conflict that rages within. Peace knowing that those in Christ have no condemnation. Now Paul explains the same idea in different ways in other letters. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. What's he saying? Well, some of you, Christians, you used to be gay, effeminate, prostitutes, liars, adulterers, cheaters. You used to be that, he says. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified. You know, that removes the counting. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Here Paul used different, uh, uses different words, but he's making exactly the same point. They had been slaves of their lower nature, but because of their relationship with Christ, not self-will, not personal effort, they were now considered in a different light by God. John repeats it in the book of Revelation, repeats the same idea. He says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever, amen. Through him, through his sacrifice, we are transformed into something glorious, priests, a kingdom, that's who we are before God. So the lesson is repeated over and over and over again throughout the New Testament. God deals with our esteem conflict by raising our value in His own eyes through faith in His Son. So what does that mean for our self-esteem? Number one, it means that God is the one who decides our value. God is the one who estimates our value. Not the world, not ourselves, not our possessions, not our performance. God is the one that determines what we are worth. And I would imagine that if it was like a, you know, an in-person judgment and God said to us personally, He was right there, Jesus was right there, and He'd say to us, you are priests to God, Michael, and you are this, and you are a kingdom, and a pillar in the house of God. And he would be saying all this to me, and in my own mind, because I know myself, I was saying, yeah, but you don't really know the real me. If you only knew what I did and what I thought, you wouldn't be saying that. That's the flesh. Even in the presence of God, the flesh continues to tear down anything good that God gives us freely because of His love. And so God decides our value. This means that a sober or true evaluation of our worth can only be determined by God. Not ourselves, not the world, not our possessions. This is why Paul says, I don't even judge myself, 1 Corinthians he, uh, chapter four. He wasn't saying that because he was proud or showing off. He says, no, I, I don't judge myself. That's the number one problem Christians have. They continue to judge themselves. Number two, it also means that our value is priceless. If Jesus, the only Son of God, died for us, we must be worth a great deal to God. This means that our intrinsic worth is not based on what we do or what we have. It is based on whether we have a relationship with Christ or not. That is how our value is determined in God's eyes. And if we do, we are priceless in His eyes. And then number three, accepting reality is accepting these sober truths. 
that God decides our value and our value in His eyes is priceless. priceless. Too high or too low esteem, conflict without peace, these are the signs that one has not accepted the truth about their value in God's eyes. Having sober judgment about ourselves and our worth requires that as Christians we accept the value that God gives us in Christ and we accept the ongoing conflict that we experience in the flesh, knowing that despite its presence there is no condemnation and because of Christ we are worthy enough for God and therefore we can accept ourselves. I accept me, why? Because God accepts me, that's why. Imagine, we go back to our young shooter, imagine if the young shooter in Florida had been nurtured with this truth about himself growing up. Do you really think that he would vent his anger and despair by randomly killing 17 people? Do you think he would even be in despair and confusion knowing that no matter what else was going on in his life, that he was loved and valued and accepted by God? I doubt it. And what a wasted opportunity as hundreds of thousands marched and speechified at the Washington rally, yet there was not a single voice speaking for Christ. Not a one. Not a single voice speaking about the true solution to the problem of mindless violence caused largely by feelings of despair and self-hatred that can only be soothed by the healing ointment of the gospel. I'm going to show another slide here, and this is an article with a, a link. A wonderful article written about this whole thing that adds some more material to what I'm talking about, but I just don't have time. So I have the link, you can go online you know, to Bible Talk when Hal posts this sermon. Check out that link and read that article, just more good information about this whole issue, about um, Kids killing other kids. Uh, I think you'll be blessed by this additional information. Well, let's round it up tonight, summarize. Maybe there are some people here tonight that struggle with feelings of despair and shame caused by sin and fear, low self-esteem. Please understand that Jesus offers you peace and rest from these kinds of burdens. For the people who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. There is a peace that surpasses understanding. You know, the, what, and people say, well, what's the understanding? The understanding is the calculation. You know, well, I'm good over here and I check that box, all that understanding. You know, and if I could just get all of this okay, then I would get peace. That's the understanding part. The Lord offers you peace that surpasses the calculation. Peace and acceptance because of who He now sees you as. That goes beyond human understanding. In this humble situation here, this isn't the Washington March with 200,000 people. This is the Choctaw Brethren, a couple of hundred we offer the invitation anyways. If there's any among us that needs that peace that hasn't yet confessed Christ, hasn't yet been baptized into Christ, the water is ready, the church is ready to witness your confession if you have that need. We encourage you to come forward now as Titus leads us in the song of encouragement. Shall we stand?